They don't suddenly become perfect people. I think most of you already know that. Uh, but but some people think, well, you're you know you're you're a Christian. You should be different. And indeed, Christ does begin to to do a work in our hearts as we surrender our life to Him. But Christians fail, and and and, and sometimes just as drastically and just as dramatically as other people do. So you are not perfect, but you do become forgiven, and the Holy Spirit of God comes to take up residence in your life. However, it's possible that in the course of our day we offend the Holy Spirit. We grieve Him or we resist Him. That's called sin, and that breaks the perfect communion and fellowship that we have with God. But how do you get back up again when you've fallen down, when you fail, when you've sinned against God? How do you get back up again and, and, and renew and restore that relationship with the Creator God who loves you and, and who wants to enter into a relationship with you? How do you get back up again instead of, instead of just erecting your faith how do you learn from your failures in such a way that, that, that you have more joy and power than when you began? As I said, the, the Psalms are the ancient songbook of the people of God. And, and uh, we discovered that some of the psalmists talk about fears and doubts and anger. And some of them talk about their failures and their sins as well. The Psalms are very honest in dealing with with things as they are. All the songs are very authentic and honest, but especially some of the songs coming from David, who was a king in Israel. He was known as a man after God's own heart. And some of you, if you know a little bit about the story of David, you say, how could God say, this is a man that has my heart? Because David made some big failures. He, he, he did some very bad things, but after he had fallen, he refused to stay down. And he learned to listen to God's Spirit and to respond. And, and although David committed some very serious and costly sins, those sins cost him in his life. But today we want to look especially at two songs of David that are known as songs of repentance. Songs of Repentance. Let's read uh, the first psalm in its entirety and then just a, a, a few verses of the other psalm. But there's Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, both of which were written after David sinned against God. So follow along on the screen if you'd like, or in your Bibles if you have the, your Bibles with you. And we'll read all of Psalm 32 and then we'll skip over and read a few verses as well from Psalm 51. Psalm 32 of David, of Moscow. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let everyone who is God be pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach you. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. 
And then over to Psalm 51, we'll read just verses 1 through 4 and then verses 10 through 12. From the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, and blot out my transgression. Down to verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. This psalm talks to us about the need for repentance, the way of repentance, and the secret of repentance, those three things. Let's look first at the need for repentance. Psalm 32 began with a word that we've seen in other psalms. Did you notice it? Began, blessed. Blessed is the man. That blessed in, in the Old Testament scriptures is a strong word. To be blessed is to have a, a complete life full of joy and fulfillment. The kind of life that we all really want. That's what, what, what blessing means. Most people in life that you know, that you meet on the metro or you meet in your job here in, in Paris, are looking to be happy, aren't they? A lot of people, you just ask them, what do you want out of life? They go, I'd really like to be happy. They're not, right, where they're at oftentimes, but they say that's what they want. They want a blessed life. They want to be happy. Many are looking for it in their career, in their career opportunities. Others are looking for it in romance or in marriage. Others are looking for it in their possessions. But none of those things bring the deep fulfillment and happiness that the psalmist is talking about here. What does David say? Blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. David is telling us that deep fulfillment and soul satisfaction comes from being forgiven. Jesus talks about this as well in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is invited to the home of a very religious man, a man who was a religious leader in the community, and he invites Jesus over for a meal. We don't really know what his motive was, but, but he at least was enough interested to invite Jesus over for a meal. But while Jesus is there, while he's eating, a woman who had led a very sinful life, probably a prostitute or in, in, in some kind of a life that was very sinful, came into and kind of crashed the party. Any of you ever crashed the party? No, honestly, come on. A few of you confessed. Very good. I'm glad. See, we talked about repentance. This is good for you. Okay? Some of you have crashed the party. Well, that's exactly what this woman did. She came in uninvited to the party that this very religious man was having for Jesus. And uninvited, she comes over to where Jesus is sitting, reclining, and she takes a jar of very expensive perfume, and she breaks the jar, and she pours it out on the feet of Jesus, and then she began to weep. And the perfume mixed with her tears, and as this was happening, Simon, the very religious man, the host, was thinking in his heart, Ah, oh, this Jesus, he's not a very good man. Because if he was a good man, he would know how sinful this woman was. He wouldn't have anything to do with her. He would know about her character. She, he would know what this woman is like. And he would not allow her to come in and to cry and to, to pour perfume on his feet. You see, Simon had been very cordial, but he'd been distant. He'd not even offered to wash the feet of his guests when he came in. In, in that culture, people would walk along the sandy, dirty, dusty road with their sandals. 
and all the animals that walked along the road as well. And then they would often recline as they ate, and so they needed to wash their feet because your feet might be sticking in somebody else's face uh, while you eat. And so it was just a, a normal thing to wash the feet of the guests when they came in. But Simon had not even offered that to Jesus. So cordial but very distant, didn't want to get too involved in Jesus. And Simon knew about this woman and knew about her sinful past, and he says nothing, but he's judging Jesus in his heart because he says, I know that this woman is sinful. Now Simon is a good man. I don't want you to be too hard on Simon. Simon is a religious man. And so he thinks to himself that, that somehow Jesus must not be a very good man because look at how he's letting this sinful woman touch him. But Jesus challenges the thinking of this respectful religious leader. And he says this. He says to him, Simon, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Now what did Jesus mean by that? Did he mean that, that if you're sitting here, you're a pretty good person, that you need to go out and commit some more sins? Is that what Jesus is, is inviting us to do? I don't think so, but I think he's inviting us to think about what, what forgiveness and repentance really means. Jesus is agreeing what David is saying in his song. Jesus is saying that the most blessed and fulfilled people in the world are those who know that they've been forgiven. You see, there are really only three kinds of people in the world. There are those who feel they're too good to need to be forgiven, aren't there? Maybe you know some of those. Sometimes they're a little bit difficult to get along with. But people that feel they're too good to need forgiveness. Then there are those who feel they're too bad to really ever be deeply <laughs> forgiven. And then there are those who know they need forgiveness and who receive that forgiveness. Those are the only three kinds of people there are. Those who think they're too good to be forgiven, those who think they're too bad to be forgiven, and those who have been <laughs> forgiven. If you know what it is to be deeply forgiven and you've received that, then I think you agree with David, you are blessed. You are one of the happiest people on earth. Love is the function of knowing you need it and have received it. If you think you're too good to really need to be forgiven, it will be very hard to love anyone except for yourself. Isn't that true? If you're too good to be forgiven, then you're better than everybody else around you. And so you have no need really to love them. You don't want to love them. You really only think of yourself. That was Simon's problem. He was a very good man. And as a very good man, he was able to look down on most other people around him because he prayed more than they did. He was more religious than they did. He did the right things. He did the things that God's law commanded. He was good. He was a good man. So don't be too hard on Simon. But he was one of those men who was too good to be forgiven, and he didn't feel like he needed to be forgiven. Or if you think you're too bad to really be forgiven, it will also be very difficult to love anyone besides yourself because you'll be constantly caught up in your own badness in, in, in your in, in, in how bad you feel about yourself, and, and you'll always be focused upon yourself as well. But if you know you need to be forgiven, and you found it, then you'll be filled with love and compassion because you've received something that you didn't deserve. And you will be excited to share that with someone else as well. You know, in, in traditional cultures, we come from all over, but like in the East, like in Asia, 
In traditional cultures, guilt is a, is a huge problem. There are expectations, there's laws. Here in Western culture, we've kind of done away with guilt. We say we don't even believe in sin anymore. And so, so we've tried to push guilt away. It doesn't really make it go away. It comes back in other forms. But, but in Western culture, we've tended to say we, we don't believe in those things anymore. But in, in traditional cultures, there's expectations and laws. And the one who does not live up to those expectations feels guilty. In modern Western cultures, most people have rejected the idea of guilt. Modern people refuse to feel guilty, and instead they say things like, well, if we, don't we all create our own right and wrong? Don't we all create our own morality? Each of us decides for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. But has that solved the problem? Not really. Notice what David said in verse 32, or in chapter 32, the very first verse again. Blessed is the man whose sin is covered. What's he talking about? Does he mean just like it's hidden? No. He's really referring to the, the, the first story in the Bible that talks about sin entering the world. It's the story of Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve sinned against God, the Bible says suddenly their eyes were open and they realized they were naked. You see, before sin came into the world, they, they, they were perfectly transparent to God and to one another. They, they, they were naked physically, but, but I think more it's talking about being naked emotionally, and, and, and they were totally transparent to one another, and they loved living that way. But when sin came into the world, they were afraid. <coughs> and they sewed fig leaves together to hide their nakedness, to cover over. There's a deep need for all of us to be covered. Even those of us who refuse to believe in God or, or, or those who say, I don't believe in guilt anymore, they still have this need. Jean Paul Sartre, the, the French existentialist, uh, in his book, Being and Nothingness, he was not at all a believer. He was an atheist. But he gives an illustration uh, of this very thing. He says, can you imagine that you're in a room and you're looking through the keyhole, you know, the, the little hole in the door, and, and you're looking through the keyhole and you see another room and, and you see everything that's going on in that room and they don't know you're watching them. And so, of course, you feel a little bit, you feel powerful because you see what they're doing and they don't really see you and so you're looking into that room you 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 see all that's going on and you feel pretty good but then you hear a noise behind you and you look and suddenly you see there's another keyhole <laughs> someone's watching you <laughs> all of a sudden that's not so comfortable anymore all of a sudden you don't feel so powerful anymore John Sartre says you don't want to be uncovered. He's arguing that we all really want to be covered. To be uncovered is to be is to feel naked, is to be vulnerable. If someone has total access to us, they will see us as we really are. They will know our thoughts and our reactions and we will be ashamed. Sartre did not believe in God. But he was pointing out the fact that none of us, even in Western cultures, if we've given up this idea of sin, none of us even lives up to our own expectations. You may not think sin exists anymore, but do you even hear yourself saying to someone else, you know, you ought to do that, or you should live this way. Isn't it it's interesting? We still have these, these ideas of, of what's right and what's wrong and what's just and what's not just. And, and, and so we have a problem with guilt and shame even when we try to deny modern people have rejected guilt. We still have an inner voice. That inner voice sometimes says, you're a loser. You're a fake. You're a fool. Have an inner voice that tells you that? I was just talking to someone at the retreat this week. Said she went through a terrible experience in her life. And, and, and English was not only her first language, but, but she said she heard a voice in her head. You're a loser. You're going through this. You're a loser. That's, what, that's the voice. That's the voice. That's all of us here at some times. Why 
Do you always want others to see the good side of you? Why are you putting up a front? Why are you working so hard to be accept successful? Why are you starving yourself to be thin? Why are you paying money you don't have for the latest fashion so that you will look good? You're covering. It's a way of hiding. Deep down, all of us know there's something wrong with us. And that's why David says, blessed is the man whose sin is covered. That's what he's talking about. Who has a covering from God. What peace that would be to know that God has covered you and you don't have to cover yourself anymore. No spin, no overwork. You wouldn't have to worry so much about what you look like in the mirror. You wouldn't have to be afraid of being exposed. To be forgiven is to have God accept you and to have God cover your sin. That's what David said. Blessed is that person who has his sin forgiven and covered. That's the need of repentance. How about the way of repentance? Notice what David says in verse 5 of chapter 32. Then I acknowledge my sin to you, God. I did not cover up my iniquity. Here's the same idea of covering. The same idea, but this time David says, I don't cover it over. You see, what's he saying? <laughs> He's saying we have to uncover before God, before we get his covering. That's what repentance is. Seems like a kind of a paradox, doesn't it? Seems hard to understand. God knows already who we really are, what we're really like, but as long as we try to hide, as long as we lie to others and ourselves and to God, we cannot know that blessedness. Notice what happened to David in verse 3. He says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Some of us spend a lot of time comparing ourselves to others so that we don't look quite so bad. We look at our own sin and we minimize it because we can always find someone who's worse, can't we? You can always be a Simon. You can always find someone who's a worse sinner than you are. After all, then when you look at that, you say, I'm not so bad, God. <laughs> you know, I'm not like that, that poor woman that came in here and, and poured the perfume. I'm not that bad. But minimizing our sin so that we don't feel so bad about it is just a way that we cover ourselves rather than coming to God for His covering. Another false route is those who who feel very sorry about the consequences of their sin and, and not really sorry about the fact of their sin. have to tell a story on someone now, and you're all worried, but it's really on myself, okay? The first year that I moved to France, I didn't own a car. I used mostly public transport, but, but the mission that we, we work with, the mission, had a van that I borrowed from time to time, mostly to, to pick up di different people at the airport. I was driving on my American license. We camped for the first year. I hadn't yet gotten my French license. And I didn't really understand the whole speed camera idea. Uh, and I didn't know what those little boxes were uh, along the side of the road. And uh, it, nothing happened until the end of the year. It was right about Christmas time. I got a Christmas present from the French government. I got three speeding tickets mailed to me. They came to the mission office one day after another. And so the, at that point, the mission director would call me and say, Alan, were you driving the van on such and such a day? And I'd look it up and go, yeah. He goes, guess what? We got a speeding ticket. Okay, okay, the first day. The second day, he called. Same thing. Were you driving the van on such and such a day? Yes. Guess what? We got another speeding ticket. He called the third day. Were you driving the van on such and such a day? Yeah, it was me. Guess what? <laughs> three. I got three presents from the French government for Christmas that year. It was really nice. Um, and I do have to confess that I was much sorrier for the consequences of my sin at that point <laughs> than for the fact of my sin. I'd already forgotten. Oh, but it was the same camera, too. Every time. <laughs> All three. Same camera, it's in Versailles. I'm going to go buy and paint, spray paint. No, uh, but true repentance means that we recognize our sin is against the holy God and we have offended him. 
In verse 9 in chapter 32, David gives the illustration of a horse or a mule who learns to obey his master because of the bridle in his mouth. And, and, and the mule, of course, would love to wander off the path and, and eat some of the fresh grass in the meadow. But the rider pulls the bridle and, and pulls the mule back to stay on the path. You see, the mule only changes because of the consequences. That's the only reason that he comes back to the path, is because something's tugging in his mouth that hurts. And so he comes and comes back to the path. He's not so much sorry for his action as he is sorry for the consequences of his action. But David says here, don't be like the horse or the mule. Don't be like that. But learn to delight in the instructions of the Lord and follow his way and his counsel. In Psalm 51, David says to God, against you and you only have I sinned. Now, how can he write that? You remember his story, don't you? Didn't he sin against Uriah? Uriah was the husband of the woman that he committed adultery with. Certainly he sinned against him, not only committed adultery with this man's wife, but then had him killed, put in, put in the front of the, uh, of the battle so that he would be killed, so that David's sin would not be showed up. Didn't he realize he'd also sinned against Uriah? I believe he sinned against Bathsheba as well because uh, did you, she didn't really have a choice. If the king calls you to come and sleep with you, it's really sexual abuse. She didn't have any choice. How is she going to say no to the king who calls her and says this is what's going to happen? So he sinned against her as well. But you see what he's saying is when we stop making excuses for our behavior, and acknowledge the extent of our sin before God, that that's when we begin to, to deal with what repentance really is. So many of us try to cover our sin with rationalization or with blame shifting. That's not really confession. You ever had someone come and, and, and try to ask forgiveness and they say, they say to you, uh, Paco, if I hurt your feelings, please forgive you. If I hurt your feelings, that's not, that's not a repentance. If you have to decide, did I please forgive me for hurting your feelings? Not if. If kind of gets us off the hook, doesn't it? <laughs> so rationalization or blame shifting or excuses have to end. The way of repentance is found in verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you, O God. And I did not cover up my iniquity. Instead, I searched for the covering that came from God for true forgiveness. And one last idea we also see in verse 7, the secret of forgiveness. David goes on, he says, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I confessed, and God forgave. You say, what's the secret about that? Uh, that's, a, that's a good deal. Did it ever happen to you when you were in school, or I'm the, am I the only one that this happened to, that I would go to class and I wasn't really very prepared, and the teacher said, uh, students, we have a surprise test today. Take out your notebooks. We're going to do a, a, a pop quiz. We're going to do a, 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 a surprise test. And, so you take out your pencil and paper, you hadn't done your lesson, you do terrible. You get an F on the, on the, the test or whatever they do in France, uh, probably a 5 or 20, a 6 or F, so whatever they do in France, it's a really bad grade. You get that, but then uh, the, the, the teacher says, oh, I just want you to know, it's just a practice test. <laughs> they tear it up and throw it away. It doesn't count. It doesn't count against you. And you, ah, you fear goes away and you feel blessed at that moment don't you it doesn't count toward your final grave that's exactly what david says happens when god forgives our sin he says the lord does not count this against you when God forgives your sin, it's no longer counted against you. Your sin has nothing to do with your final grave. Hmm. How is that possible? We get just a hint here in verse 7. Let everyone who is godly pray to you. You are my hiding place. 
When David repented of his sin, he had a sense that he could hide in God, that he could be covered over by God rather than covering them himself. He had covered for a long time. For a long time, he had stayed in his sin until the prophet Nathan uh, came to him and confronted him. But now he found that God was his covering, that God was his hiding place. How is it that God can be just and forgive us when we are truly responsible and guilty before him. Here we know something that David didn't know. You see, when someone was crucified, he was stripped utterly naked before everyone. He was spread eagle on a cross. His hands and his feet were nailed, his arms wide apart. You didn't just die a slow, excruciating death. You died exposed before the entire world. It was the ultimate keyhole, if you will, the ultimate vulnerability, the ultimate dehumanization. And that's what Jesus experienced when he came to earth. He was crucified in my place. He was uncovered. He was stripped bare. He was naked and beaten before a watching world. He experienced the ultimate humiliation and shame. Why did he do that? He was stripped bare so that I could be clothed. That's the gospel message. That's what the gospel tells us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God counted Jesus as a sinner so that our sin would not have to be counted against us. When you are forgiven, your sins are no longer counted on your final grade. Here's the secret of repentance and forgiveness. You have to change your hiding place. When you've confessed your sins to God, but you still can't get over your guilt, it's because something else is more important to you than God and God's Word. You ever counsel anyone like that? I have. They, 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 they come and they confess an awful thing, whatever it is. And then they pray and they say, you know, uh, okay, I, I can maybe believe God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. And then I say, so you're more important than God. Your word is more important than his. He's the one who says that he forgives you. When you know that because of Jesus, that Jesus was uncovered so that you could be covered. When you know that because of Jesus, you're accepted and forgiven by the Creator God, you don't have to cover yourself anymore. You don't have to rationalize. You don't have to blame shift. You don't have to excuse. You don't have to cover up. You don't have to repress it. You don't have to screen it out. You can be quick to admit when you're wrong because your identity is not found anymore being right. It's found in being loved and being forgiven. Are you a safe person to confess to? Can people come to you and tell, tell you things that, that have gone wrong in their life? And uh, Are you a safe person to criticize? Do you have the blessedness of the one who doesn't have to cover anymore? Because God covers you. That's exactly what David said here. He said, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man or the woman whose sin the Lord does not count against him. Do you know that blessedness? Let's pray together. <laughs>